Isaiah chapter number 60, beginning in verse number 1, Isaiah 60, and then verse number 1. Arise, shine, for thy light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. And the Gentiles shall come to thy light, and kings to the brightness of thy rising. Father, I thank you this morning for uh, salvation that we do enjoy through the Lord Jesus Christ. And if anybody that I'm talking to uh, right now has not uh, had that salvation, Lord, applied to their soul, I pray that you would move in their hearts and souls, drawing them to the Lord Jesus Christ and help them to see their need and uh, help them get saved. I pray for your blessing upon the message. I pray you do through me what I cannot do uh, in and of my own power and uh, minister, Lord, uh, to the people today. And uh, help us, Lord, as uh, you know, we get uh, caught up in this, uh, this world of uh, all the cares, all the uh, troubles. Uh, may we just uh, have a little bit of a, a sanctified time here this morning, uh, separated from that. Uh, just, uh, Lord, just basking in the sunshine and sunlight of the Son of God. And uh, may it not just end here, but may it strengthen us to go forth and uh, live for thee and shine out there as well. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Now, what you have in the context of what I read to you this morning in Isaiah chapter 60 is uh, the dawning of a new day. Arise, shine, for thy light is come. In the doctrinal context of the passage is a time in the future when the nation of Israel is restored to her former glory and then actually exceeds that glory uh, as the Lord sets her on high above all nations on the earth, uh, of the earth. This dawning of a new day will be the millennial dawn to come. Uh, after the second advent of Jesus Christ, with Israel then being the head, not the tail, in accordances with God's promises in Deuteronomy chapter 28, something that we've been coming across recently in our Sunday school studies in the book of Psalms. And I want to assure you this morning that that day will come. Sometimes it looks like the devil's winning, uh, but uh, if he's winning, it's only temporary. We haven't gotten to the bottom of the ninth yet. We're not in the fourth quarter yet. Uh, when it's all said and done, uh, Jesus wins. And it's not here yet. I mean, we're still awaiting some things. We're still awaiting the rapture of the church, uh, followed by the seven years of uh, great tribulation, culminating with the Lord Jesus Christ coming back to this earth upon a white horse to set up his kingdom in a hostile takeover. And he will, uh, like as described. In Revelation chapter 1, verse 7, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. And they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. And, uh, and the Lord's going to come, and he's going to restore his people. Romans chapter 11, uh, verse 26 and 27, So all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. <clears throat> For this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. And this glorious day will find the Lord Jesus Christ ruling on this very earth that we walk today. He'll be ruling as King of kings and Lord of lords. And the apostles, the apostles are going to be sitting upon 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And the Bible says, it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow into it. And many people shall go and say, come ye, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. Uh, that's his people, Israel. And he will teach us of his ways and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. That's coming on this very earth that we're living in. And he shall judge among the nations and shall rebuke many people. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Isaiah chapter 2, verses 2 through 4. And it's like that uh, song that was based on that. Uh, I ain't going to study war no more down by the riverside. They're not going to learn it anymore. Even so, come Lord Jesus, that's going to come to this earth. And uh, this earth is going to be ruled by the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, it'll be it'll not be sin reigning, but it'll be the Savior reigning. And uh, the words and the songs that come from people's lips uh, will redound to the glory of God on this, again, very earth, the same terrain that we're living on uh, even now. It is in anticipation of this time that the Lord tells us the end from the beginning here in Isaiah chapter 60. And again, though we're not there yet, the last thing the Lord says in this chapter is, I, the Lord, will hasten it in his time. And in his time, he will. And it will come to pass, just like all of the Lord's prophecies have come or will come to pass. And when that time comes, 
Uh, he will say to Israel the words in verse number one, Arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. And boy, Israel longs to hear those words. Even though they don't fully grasp it yet, and blindness in part is still upon them, uh, but they long for that restoration. Now with this context uh, understood, I want to bring you a, pass uh, a, a practical message and a personal exhortation from this passage uh, this morning. Uh, let's remember that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and it's all profitable for doctrine, but also for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. And listen, if you're a man, uh, you ought to desire to be a man of God. And if you're a woman, you ought to desire to be a woman of God. And so today we're going to look for some reproof, some correction, and some instruction of righteousness from Isaiah chapter 60 and verse number 1 to help us toward that goal of being perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. <clears throat> I recall as a child, my mother uh, exhorting me to get up in the morning with a saying that is derived from Isaiah chapter 60 verse 1. She would say to me sometimes, she'd say, rise and shine, always so cheery. And I was not always so cheery at that point. <laughs> but she would say, rise and shine. And, of course, this is a, a saying like, like many that have worked its way from the Bible into our vocabulary on this earth um, in our English language. And God said in Isaiah 60, verse 1, he starts out saying, arise, shine. And so we kind of have morphed that into rise and shine. And I'm going to preach to you uh, this morning on the subject, arise and shine. Arise and shine. Uh, again, not only myself, but many a sleeper has been exhorted with the saying, rise and shine. And again, depending on how that sleeper feels, you might get different reactions to that exhortation. Uh, one who has slept well and is excited about the day may jump out of bed with a smile, eagerly anticipating the day that is before him. By the way, have you ever done that? <laughs> do you ever do that? Um, uh, but another might wake up groggy, not wanting to face the day, and then he might get angry at the exhorter. And as this saying has come to mean, uh, wake up, you know, a new day has dawned and it's right there before you and it's time to get up and, and, and face it uh, and time to get up and, and really seize it, seize the day. And as that has come to mean that, our first point along those same lines is going to be uh, arise and awake from your sleep, from your sleep. The Apostle Paul charged the Ephesians with a similar exhortation on a spiritual level, now we're talking about awaken from spiritual slumber. That's what I'm talking about, awaken from spiritual sleep. And he said this in Ephesians 5.14, Awake thou that sleepest and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. And if you're saved, of course, you're, you're not, no longer dead in trespasses and sins, but on a practical level, there are Christians who, who well, they're kind of dead. Uh, they, they, they're not filled with the Holy Ghost. They're walking after the flesh, and if you walk after the flesh, you know, it's uh, to be carnally minded is, is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. And if you are like that today, and, or, or maybe, it's, maybe it's not even just an overt sin in your life, it's just kind of your, you know, you're just kind of spiritually drained, and, and you feel like you're kind of just dying on the vine here, uh, I want to say to you, arise and shine, awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead. Many a Christian today has fallen into that deep spiritual slumber, and, and they're sleeping that sleep of death. Uh, they've been lulled to sleep by the lullabies of the world and the flesh and, and the devil, and they've been overtaken by the spirit of slumber. And they may walk around in, and with their eyes open, but uh, spiritually speaking, uh, they're in a dream world. And this morning, uh, one of the reasons why you're here is for God to try to wake you up if you're one of those uh, sleepers and, uh, and, and hear th through the voice of the preaching sounded, sounding off like, um, like the trumpet of an alarm clock to awake you out of that spirit uh, of slumber. And uh, I hope that uh, if you need that, I hope you'll be shaken and wakened this morning. You know, it, it, there's some people that get into deep sleep, and it is hard to wake them up. Now, if you ever encountered anybody like that, or I don't know if you are like that, <clears throat> but sometimes folks get in a deep sleep, you can shake them, you can uh, speak loudly, and they just, I mean, after a while, you got to check if they're breathing. And then you find they are, and... and um, I mean, uh, how come somebody sleep through that? But some do. And I'm telling you, there's some people that are in that level spiritually asleep. And though the, the pulpit gets pounded and the voice gets loud and he cries loud and spares not and lifts up his voice like a trumpet to preach. And though you shake him and God, the Holy Spirit tries to get a hold of him and, and rail him. 
They just sit there spiritually zoned out, spiritually asleep. And these things ought not so to be. But I hope that if you need it, I hope that the message will shake you and wake you. And you'll go out different than you came in, in, in a better way. And because I'm going to tell you what, there's another trumpet that's coming. And uh, the sound, God tries to gently, if you will, wake you with the sound of the trumpet of the preaching until one day you're going to be awakened with the sound of a trumpet that's going to call you on home to glory. That'll be the ultimate alarm clock. And uh, and, and Lord's going to call you on home at the rapture if you're saved. And at that point, you will wake up. You know, the time that we live in is referred to as night. Uh, the Lord Jesus is said to come as a thief in the night. And the night is getting on here, folks. It's getting on. It's getting late. It's getting real late. We're getting on into the wee hours of the morning. And we're fast approaching that time when the day shall dawn and the day star uh, arise in your heart. And the night goes on. And as that night goes on and on, it becomes harder and harder to stay awake. Uh, there's all kinds of things out there just to lull you to sleep. I remember as a kid on, on Christmas Eve, I determined uh, at least a couple Christmases, maybe more. I determined to stay awake to see Santa Claus coming. I could never stay awake. Uh, somewhere between determination and dawn, I drifted off to sleep. Now, if I had stayed awake, I wouldn't have seen him anyway, but that's another story. <laughs> Those of you who have ever worked the night shift, I mean, there comes a time, maybe it's different for everybody, somewhere, it could stay anywhere around 2.30, 3, 3.30, 4, 4.30, so, somewhere in there, there comes this time when it hits you hard and you begin to fight this battle to stay awake. I mean, a battle that you may or may not win. Uh, one summer between um, uh, Bible school uh, sessions, I spent in uh, Cleveland. And I, I got a job as a security guard at uh, the CEI plant, which was their power plant, Cleveland Electric Illuminating. And one of the posts that uh, they had there that I would work from time to time was uh, upstairs in a place where they were repairing a uh, turbine that had blown. And because it had blown, they had it fenced off and, and the workers had to log in everything and that they, they brought in. And there was just a lot of scrutinization on it. And I was working there. Um, at night sometimes, and, and, and there was nobody working at that particular time. It was just up there by myself, uh, the lights on, big empty room, and just the hum of uh, the exhaust system, and, and, and by yourself late at night, and night shift. I'm going to tell you what, I, th it was hard sometimes to stay awake. And I remember trying to stay awake. I, I was walking around trying to stay awake, stand up, and I literally, literally fell asleep on my feet and felt myself uh, waking up as I, I, I crashed over against the fence that was right next to me that uh, had that turbine uh, protected. And then I was um, sitting there at my desk uh, once, and um, I, 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 I thought I was awake, but I didn't know I had drifted off. And um, my eyes opened as I heard my uh, supervisor come up. He was coming up for one of those, you know, regular inspections. I got to do just check on and make sure everybody's at his post and awake. <laughs> and, um, and, and I heard him say, uh, amen. Now, my supervisor was a Christian. Thank God. <laughs> but, but he said, amen. And, and, and my eyes opened as he said, amen. And, and I, I said, amen. He said, yeah, when you're done praying, you're supposed to say Amen. <laughs> and he had my back thank god <laughs> but but i'll tell you what it gets hard it gets hard to uh to stay awake and i'm gonna tell you again it's getting late folks it, it's getting late it's easy for us to be lulled to sleep by the cares of this world the deceitfulness of riches and the lusts of other things entering in which choke the word and cause it to become unfruitful and the exhortation the scripture goes on like this how long wilt thou sleep o sluggard when wilt thou rise out of thy sleep? Yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. So shall thy poverty come as one that traveleth and thy want as an armed man. And I'm going to tell you what, that works in people's lives who are lazy as far as life on this earth. But uh, there's even more application to those that are spiritually lazy. I'm talking about saved people now who just uh, live in the spiritual dreamland. And just to drift off into never, never land and, and, and sleep away their Christian life, uh, so to speak. He says, so shall thy poverty come. Thy poverty comes when it traveleth. Thy poverty, as Jesus told the church at Laodicea. And what he told them, folks that thought they were doing pretty good, 
Here's what he said to them. Knowest not, he said to them, that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Why, they thought they were doing good, but they were spiritually poor. They said, hey, I, I'm doing good. We're, we, got, we got it going on here. Everything, we got, we're rich, increased with good. Everything's fine. But no, Lord said, you're, you're miserable, poor, blind, and, and naked and wretched, he said. They were spiritually poor at the time that, that Jesus said this to them. And they were in danger of becoming spiritually poor at the judgment seat when they stood before Jesus Christ. And so the Lord, knowing they were in spiritual poverty right then, tried to wake them up out of their slumber so that they would begin to serve him and live for him so that when they did get up there, they would not be spiritually poor. For after he had said those things to him, to, to the church at Laodicea, uh, he said to them, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich. But right now you're poor. If you want to be rich, you're going to have to buy from me some gold tried in the fire. Now they got salvation, the foundation, which is Jesus Christ, and they're to build upon that gold, silver, and precious stones. But they were just filling it up with wood, hay, and stubble. He said, I counsel you to buy of me some gold tried in the fire. And thou mayest be rich in white raiment that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. He said, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. It's hard to get a sleeping person to be zealous. I mean, you see them dragging out of the bed, and, and, and they don't want to get up, and they're dragging in there and trying to get washed up, maybe get something down their uh, hats to, 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 to try to wake up. But, but it's hard to get them going. It's hard to get somebody spiritually asleep awake. It's hard to get them going. It's hard to get them to be zealous. But the Lord said uh, to them, essentially, wake up and get some zeal about you. Open your eyes and, um, and see what's going on and make the necessary changes. That's why he rebuked him and chased him, because he loved him. He loved him. You know, as a pastor, one of the things that uh, I want for the saved people in the church is, is I want them to have a good judgment seat of Christ. Well, I, I want you to be ready. I want the lost people to know Jesus and get to heaven. I want the saved people uh, to be able to present their life before the Lord and, and get a well done, thou good and faithful servant. But uh, I can't live your life for you no more than you can live my life for me. I try to shake you and wake you and, and hope that God will get a hold of you. And if you need it, let him, let him. Because these exhortations come again and again and again over time. And the Bible says, he that being often reproved hardeneth his neck shall suddenly be destroyed and that without remedy. There is a danger in just letting these things wash over you without letting them change you. That trumpet will sound at the rapture leading us to the judgment seat of Christ. Again, that will be the ultimate alarm clock. It will wake us up to see what we really look like in God's sight. In the eyes of the Lord, he, he sees things that, uh, that we don't. And we'll see it then. Uh, this uh, period is, uh, is typified by the Apostle Peter after denying Jesus Christ for the third time. Uh, come with me, if you would, to Luke chapter 22 and see what Peter saw at that time. Luke chapter 22, starting at the end, uh, toward the end of the chapter, verse 59. Luke twenty two fifty nine, and about the space of one hour after... Another confidently affirmed, saying of a truth, this fellow also is with him, for he is a Galilean. And Peter said, Man, I know not what thou sayest. And immediately while he yet spake, the cock crew. The cock crew. That signifies uh, a new day. The cock crew. And the Lord turned and looked upon Peter, and Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how that he said unto him before the cock crowed, Thou shalt deny me thrice. And Peter went out and wept bitterly. I'm going to tell you what you have here uh, in Peter's experience, a, a tr tragic, terrible experience for him. What you have here is a picture of what's going to be like for a lot of people at the judgment seat of Christ. Again, the cock crow is a signal of the dawning of a, of a new day. And that trumpet sounds and you're, you're ushered into God's eternal day. And then in verse 61, the Lord looked upon Peter. Their eyes met, just as your eyes are going to meet with the Lord's eyes at the judgment seat of Christ. And those eyes of Jesus, the Bible describes in Revelation chapter 1, verse 14, as a flame of fire. And it'll be a fire that looks at you and melts down to the depths of your soul. 
And uh, you will know how you fare at that point. And you will know that he knows and he, boy, I mean, it's just, uh, there's no place to run, no place to hide. You'll be standing there without excuse before your Savior. And according to 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 13, your works as a Christian, whether they're good or bad, are going to be tried by fire. I tend to think that fire is going to be kindled by the very fiery eyes of the Lord Jesus Christ, the King of kings and Lord of lords. As he sits upon his judgment seat, even as described in Proverbs chapter 20, verse 8, a king that sitteth in the throne of judgment scattereth away all evil with his eyes. And there the King of kings sits in his throne of judgment with his fiery eyes to dispel the works of wood, hay, and stubble, and hopefully to leave something, gold, silver, and precious stones, abiding the fire. And Peter's eyes meet the Lord Jesus Christ. At that point, though, what happened to Peter will happen to you. It says in verse 61, the Lord and the Lord turned upon, and the Lord turned and looked upon Peter, and Peter remembered the word of the Lord. And you will up there remember the word of the Lord. I mean, the at the great white throne judgment, which which is not the same as the judgment seat of Christ, but at the great white throne judgment, the books are open. And that's going to include those 66 books of your Bible. I'll tell you what Jesus did tell us. He said, the word, the word that I've spoken, the same shall judge you in the last day. And your life will go right up against this uh, book. And it'll all come back to you. will remember the word of the Lord. Those verses that you heard and didn't take seriously enough to obey, you will remember them. Amen. Your heart will be wrung out within you as you realize you have just blown and missed your last opportunity to live by faith and show Jesus just how much you did love him and appreciate what he'd done for you. And then like Peter, in verse 62, you might go out and do some bitter weeping. That weeping might sound like the weeping and the wailing of, uh, of another who also gives us a, a picture of the judgment seat of Christ, an Old Testament character named Esau. Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. The Bible says, for you know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. He would have inherited the blessing. Colossians 3.24 talks about the reward of the inheritance that a Christian might obtain, uh, given at the judgment seat of Christ. This is an earned reward. Again, not salvation. That's the gift that's got to be received. But the rewards are things that you earn after salvation by what you do for the Lord. And how you live. And this earned reward of the inheritance will be awarded to a Christian who properly lived for the Lord, properly served him. Esau sold that out. And he pictures a Christian who sold out his reward for in, of inheritance for the flesh. More so than meat. I want you to hear Esau as he cries over his loss in Genesis chapter 27, verse 38. And think we might hear these same words being cried by, by folks at the judgment seat of Christ. Or similar. And Esau said unto his father, Hast thou but one blessing, my father? Bless me, even me also, O my father. And Esau lifted up his voice and wept. But as we already read, he was rejected. And he found no place for repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. When, when your life is over, your opportunities are over. And the Bible says, as we therefore have opportunity, let us do good unto all men. This is your opportunity to serve Jesus. This is your opportunity to build upon that foundation. When, when your life is over or the trumpet sounds, opportunities are finished. And, and perhaps you need to awaken today and quit squandering this life, this, all, this little precious time. You could all bog down with all the uh, extras out there, all the, all the things that are the affairs of this life. That, that really you have a little to no control over. You pray about those things and then focus on Jesus Christ and your life for him. Don't miss your opportunity or the devil's going to keep you preoccupied with the cares of this world and the affairs of this life till Jesus comes and you're going to miss your chance to serve him. If this spirit of deep sleep is upon you, let, let, let me say, these experiences, Peter, Esau, it could be your experience at the judgment seat, or if, if, if you're trending that way, and right now that spirit of deep sleep is upon you, you could arise from your sleep, and you could awake today, and you could begin to, uh, to, to head in the direction you're supposed to be heading in, and awake 
Romans chapter 13, and that knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. 1 Corinthians 15, 34, Awake to righteousness and sin not, for some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. Arise and awake from your sleep. That's number one. Number two. Let me uh, suggest this for those that uh, need it or may need it in the future. Arise out of your discouragement and depression. He said here, he said back in Isaiah 60, arise, shine. Some folks don't shine. Their light is dim. Things look dark. They have a dark outlook. They are discouraged. They are depressed. And I want to tell you, folks, listen, I know it. God knows it. It is true. Discouragement and dis depression are real things. I deal with people that, that go through it. And sometimes it's just like waking somebody up out of sleep. It's hard to get them up out of that sometimes. I say hard, but in both cases, not impossible. Because with God, all things are possible. And, and discouragement and depression are real things. And, and many a person battles them in silence, even many a Christian. And if you're one of those people, I want you to know right now that there is hope for you. There's hope for how depressed or how discouraged you feel and how dark it looks. There's hope. With the help of God, you can arise out of your depressed state. How do you think of the word depress? Depress. Depress. It's something or someone pressing down on you, keeping you from rising up. You've got to rise up from that pressure, that depressed state. A uh, doctor takes a, a little wooden stick, like, like a clean popsicle stick. At least we hope it's clean. And, uh, and he presses your tongue down. They call it a tongue depressor. And that's something pressing down. And, and we have things that press down on our, our being, our spirits, our souls. Your adversary, the devil, will seek to oppress you and depress you to keep you down. And there's a lot of things that can bring about uh, depression. A lot of bring, things that bring about uh, discouragement. There's many reasons. And let me say, folks, that the condition begins as discouragement. And discouragement is, as the word suggests, it's, it's a loss of courage, discourage. And when you lose courage, it's, it's hard to fight. You just don't feel like you can face things. You just, you just don't have it in you. You're, you're afraid. It's, nothing's going to work. The loss of courage, the discouragement, when not properly addressed, then can turn into depression. And then depression, when not properly addressed, can turn into despair. Uh, you, should, you should understand, and I, I hope that you'll get this down so deeply that uh, you'll never get to this place. But for a Christian, there is absolutely no reason whatsoever for you to despair. Because when this is all said and done, you live happily ever after. So at worst, even if your life was going to be miserable to the day you die, you're still going to wind up on top of things. And that being said, your life doesn't have to be miserable to the day you die. You have a, a choice to make inside, whether to live filled with the Spirit, which provides you with the feeling of, of love, joy, and peace, among other things, or to let the devil take you down and, uh, and, and circumstances and just, just be upset and troubled. And it's no way to live. In fact, one of the reasons I got saved because I got tired of living like that. And when I saw the invitation, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. I, I said in so many words, I'm in. I'm laboring. I'm heavy laden. I'm worn out with this thing. I want that rest. And he gave it to me. And I got saved. And I don't know, a year, year and a half, uh, two years, somewhere later, I began to just bear all the burdens of all the knowledge and the wisdom and the messed up condition of the world and all the trouble, I began to be pressed down under them again. And I got thinking about Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 again, and I thought, you know what, if the, I know I'm already saved, but if that worked good for me being saved, and, and here I am to, to get saved, and here I am saved, and once again, I'm laboring and I'm heavy laden, why not just come again? 
I didn't have to come and get saved again, but I came back to Jesus again in, a, in kind of a fresh way and cast my burden upon him and found that rest and that peace uh, once again. So, so discouragement can turn into depression. Depression can turn into despair. But, but you can back that thing up. You don't need to be discouraged. You don't need to be depressed. You don't need to be in despair. But you may find yourself there sometimes. And if you find yourself there, I'm not saying that you've sinned because you are there. But I'm saying once you recognize that you're there, you need to get yourself out. You can't keep from being discouraged or being overtaken by discouragement. You can keep from living there. That loss of courage, it, it can be a tough, uh, tough thing. But you can arise to get into a place of sustainable joy. I want you to believe that and understand it because it's true. Uh, there's different things that bring these things on. Sometimes, sometimes discouragement, the depression, even despair, sometimes these are brought about by physical conditions. Uh, your body ailing. Sometimes they're brought about by an unhealthy diet. I had to recognize in my own life uh, certain things that uh, I put into my body uh, were, were causing me to, to suffer some discouragement and feel depressed. And I had to trace it down to, uh, to the element and, and, and I had to get out of the sugar blues, which it was in my case. And sometimes these things can be brought about by disappointments. Uh, disappointments. Think about that word, disappointment. Here in your mind, you had appointed something to happen a certain way. Didn't happen that way. And you were disappointed. These things can leave you discouraged. Difficulties of life can leave you discouraged. Troubles, trials, tribulations, they can, they can press upon you and, and, and get you into a depressed state. Defeats. Defeats can, can, can discourage people. Sometimes you, you just need some victories. And, and the defeats can put you down. But in each case, and whatever the particular reason, at, at part of the root for these things, or at the root of these things, whatever the reason, the devil jumps on board and uses those things and, and heightens this thing in the realm of spiritual warfare. And he tries to use these things to keep you down, depressed, and out of the fight to try to dull your light and get it under a bushel so you're not shining. God wants you to rise and shine as lights in this dark world. Whatever the case, though, whatever the reason, wherever you're at, the Lord can get you out of it, and He can help to get you to the root and root out that thing. And, and if you find yourself a person that goes through a lot of discouragement, if you find yourself depressed, ask the Lord. Say, Lord, God, here, here I am. The truth is I am discouraged. I am depressed. And if it's so, Lord, I'm, I'm even battling despair. Just talk to him, be honest. And, and then say, Lord, would you help me, please, out of this thing? I don't know how to get out of it. I don't know the answers. People got all kinds of things they say. I don't know. Lord, would you help me to get to the root of these things and, and fix this for me? However, you could just ask God to help because he can and he's willing to do that. But whatever, the, whatever you need, you know, he, can, he can help you get to the root. He can help you get out of that slew of despond, like uh, Bunyan, Bunyan called it in the Pilgrim's Progress. God can help you. And you can take steps to help yourself. Just wait around and, and hope. Take steps. David, in the Old Testament, had been sent back from fighting alongside the Philistines as the Philistines prepared to go up against uh, Saul in Israel. I'm just going through this again in my uh, regular Bible reading. Uh, he and his men headed back to their home in Ziklag, and they arrived and found it burned to the ground. And what was worse, their wives and their sons and their daughters were gone, for the Amalekites had invaded Ziklag and taken them away captive. And David and his men, they were distraught, as you could well imagine. And, and you could only imagine, I mean, you could imagine their distress, but it'd be, I mean, we could really only imagine what it would have been like for them to come back and find that whole place burnt and, and all their families gone. And we could only imagine what it must have sounded like when the Bible says that all of them lifted up their voice and wept until they had no more power to weep. Now, we're talking a group of men. We're talking a group of soldiers, hundreds of them, looking there and, and weeping audibly until they had no more power to weep. I mean, it, I don't know that the world's ever quite heard it on that level, but it did that day. And in 1 Samuel chapter 30 and verse number 6, the Bible says of David, and David was greatly distressed. 
Who could blame him? Compounding all of the things that he himself had gone through, and as the leader of what his people had gone through, to compound all those things, it says the people spake of stoning him. Because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and for his daughters. So, I mean, David, he's, he's, he's down, out, and now they're, they're talking about killing him. Uh, look, hundreds of men. It ain't going to take much for them to overwhelm David and, and, and do him in if they want to. At this point, a lesser man than David might have run off and hid. A lesser man than David at this point might have fallen on his sword. However, however, before that verse ended, the Bible says this, but David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. And I'm telling you to, this morning, that's what you can do. You can encourage yourself in the Lord your God. Yeah, you may be discouraged. Yeah, you may be depressed. You might even be in despair. But you can encourage yourself in the Lord your God anytime you want. Get you alone with God. Get you in a closet and pray. Get you cut off from this world and open up that book and read until the light begins to shine. Read until the crusty, stony heart begins to, to break and the ice begins to melt and the Lord begins to warm you up. Boy, this is this word's like a fire. It, it'll, it'll bring warmth in this cold world to you. And David, he rose up from his discouragement. He rallied the troops. He prayed to the Lord. He got the answer from God. And they went forth and found the camp of the Amalekites, and he recovered all. But again, a lesser man might have just quit. Well, don't you be a lesser man or a lesser woman. Encourage yourself in the Lord. I'm likely talking to somebody right now who's, who's down and out. I'm likely talking to somebody right now who's um, discouraged. Maybe depressed, maybe in despair, or maybe that's kind of how you go through the week. Now, you can stay down and depressed, or you can arise and shine. It is your choice. We, we like to think it's not. We like to think this is just my lot, and this was what happened to me, and I have no control over it. You have control over things. You don't have control over, every, you don't have control over everything that happens to you, but you have control over how you respond to what happens to you. It's all you can do. You can stay down and depressed. You can rise and shine. It is in the power of your will to make that choice. So I, I exhort you simply arise and shine and encourage yourself in the Lord your God. Listen to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 8 and 9. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. That's some verses for you right there. Yeah, you've got trouble on every side sometimes in this world, but you don't have to be stressed about it. You don't have to be in distress. You can be perplexed and confused, like, what in the world is going on now? But you don't have to be in despair. You can even be persecuted, but he has said, I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee. You might even be cast down, but you don't have to be out. Again, remember, discouragement, as we said before, it, it's discouraged. It's that loss of courage. Uh, someone has aptly said, courage is not the absence of fear. It is the presence of God. And truly, that, uh, that will work for a Christian. With God on your side, you can go forth with confidence, even if all of your fears have not yet subsided. I mean, I mean you sometimes go on in, in fear, but you go with faith. That the Lord is with you. Uh, Carl Wilson Baker was a, a female American poet and writer. She spelled her first name K-A-R-L-E. And Carl Wilson Baker wrote an insightful and powerful little three-line poem published 99 years ago in October of uh, 1921. And she said this, talking about uh, courage. She said, courage is armor a blind man wears. That calloused scar of outlived despairs. Courage is fear that has said its prayer. Some of you might need to do, you might need to go take your discouragement into that prayer closet and say your prayers until God fills you with his courage. Would you come with me to the book of Micah? Toward the end of your Old Testament, in the Mitre Prophets, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah. Right before Nahum, before Habakkuk, 
Micah chapter 7. Verse number 7. Micah 7, verse 7. Therefore, I will look unto the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. Listen to this exhortation. Rejoice not against me, O mine enemy. When I fall, I shall arise. When I sit in darkness, the Lord shall be a light unto me. I'm looking for something fresh maybe to, to get you out of the uh, depths of despair and the slew of despond. Here's, here's something for you. And the enemy may press you down, but uh, you can know as a just man, you can rise up again. And, and this is like uh, Micah, like David, encouraging himself in the Lord, his God. So arise, number two, out of your discouragement and depression. Along similar lines, let me add this. Uh, next, arise up from defeat. Arise up from defeat. You know, defeat is deflating, but defeat's part of life. Uh, you're not going to win or succeed in every last one of your endeavors. You're not going to win and succeed in every last one of your trials and, and temptations and every last one of the things you try to do. Sometimes you're going to lose. But just because you're not going to succeed in every one of your endeavors, don't let it stop you from trying. Some people let defeat keep them from, from ever trying again. And so what are you going to do? You're just going to coast on out of gas in the glory? Oh, man, go back to the spiritual drawing board and, 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 and go back and, and try to win the victory. Look, at even successful people lose some battles. You know, uh, a baseball player that's a, a batter, he can, um, if he has a batting average of, of 300 or, or over or, or even – in the high 200s, that guy can make millions upon millions of dollars. But a batting average of just, say, 300, what that means is for every 10 official at-bats, he's made seven outs. Three victories, seven defeats, but he gets paid pretty good. <laughs> What's he got to do? After he strikes out, he's got to rise up again. After he grounds in a double play, he's got to rise up again. He just got to keep on going back up there. Keep on stepping up to the plate. Uh, maybe you don't win them all. Well, you won't win them all, but you can win some. And the victories that you win uh, will be worth uh, going out and, and, and losing some battles. As a Christian, look, you're going to lose some battles. You're going to fall down in defeat. But what you do after you are defeated is going to determine what kind of Christian you're going to be. Whether you're going to have a successful Christian life or you're just going to live in failure. Even in the Bible, again, even in the Bible, it's understood that sometimes a Christian is going to suffer defeat. Oh, that verse, Proverbs 24, 16, a just, for a just man falleth seven times and riseth up again. Uh, listen to the first five words of that verse by themselves. For a just man falleth. God understands that even a just man is going to fall. We're talking about us as mere mortals. Of course, the Lord Jesus Christ was victorious, but he was God in the flesh, and thank God he was. That's where we get in on all this. But as mere mortal human beings, God understands that a just man's going to fall. But he also tells you what the just man's going to do next. He's going to rise up again. Fall seven times and riseth up again. Now, that's still not the end of the verse, because the verse goes on. So here it is in its entirety. For a just man falls seven times and riseth up again, but the wicked shall fall into mischief. So in that verse, both the just man falls and the wicked man falls, but the just man rises again and the wicked man does not. No mention of him rising again. He just falls into mischief and stays there. But the just man rises up again. So if you've taken a fall, or should you take one in the future, uh, arise from your defeat and get some victory. When it comes to getting victory, quit listening to the voices that tell you you can't get it. Philippians 4.13 tells you you can. It says, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. So whenever you hear those voices in your head saying, I can't do something that the Lord has told you that He wants you to do from the Scriptures, hear the Holy Spirit of God loud and clear saying, I can. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Well, don't talk to yourself out of victory. Christians are good at that. 
Christians are experts at snatching defeat from the jaws of victory. Don't you talk yourself out of victory like the ten spies talked themselves out of it? And they did. Not only did they talk themselves out of it, they talked the uh, children of Israel out of it. After coming back um, uh, from the spying out the promised land, they had already seen the grapes of Esco, uh, but their vision of those grapes was swallowed up by another vision, a vision of giants. And they talked themselves into defeat. And folks, listen, you, you saying, we pick up our songbook and you saying, oh, victory in Jesus. But do you have the victory and do you believe that you can have the victory in Jesus? Scripture says you can. First Corinthians 15, 57. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So I'm saying to you, arise and, and, and get the victory. Arise and, and up from your defeat. And, and let me press on from that and take that a little bit further. And the next point, not only arise up from defeat, don't just stay down in defeat, but arise, go forth, and conquer, as the little saying goes. So I've been thinking about this, Romans chapter 8, beginning in verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long, we are counted as sheep for the slaughter, Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. More than conquerors. That means you can, with the help of God, arise, go forth, and conquer. Uh, William Carey, living in the 1700s, 1800s, known as the father of modern missions, he's famously quoted as saying the following, Expect great things from God. Attempt great things for God. You know, when um, Israel heard the evil report of, the ten, of, of 10 of the 12 spies, when they heard that, uh, they talked themselves out of going to the promised land. They talked themselves out of even trying for the victory. They were beat before they even got out there. I mean, the land was there, beautiful, lush, fruitful. They saw the grapes of Eskol. They, they said, surely it floweth with milk and honey. But then they explain about those giants. They, they said there are giants in the land, and they're big and strong, so big. We're like grasshoppers in their sight, and their cities are great and walled up to heaven. Now, look, those, both of those things are exaggerations. Their cities were not walled up to heaven. And, that, and if you do the, the math and the ratio perspective, you, you are not as small as grasshoppers in their sight. I mean, if you take a grasshopper and figure out, I don't know how many times bigger a human being is than a grasshopper. I'm just going to throw out a number. Say a thousand. Okay. If that sounds like, okay, 500. And 500 times bigger than a grasshopper. That means that the uh, giants they saw would have been 500 times bigger than them. They weren't. It's an exaggeration. The devil oftentimes exaggerates just how bad things are in your mind. But they heard it. And when the people heard it, they cried and they quit, and then they got mad at the preacher. <laughs> Both of them, Moses and Aaron, preacher and his assistant. <laughs> and in so doing, they ignored the advice of the only two spies that had good sense, Joshua and Caleb. And Joshua and Caleb, he tried, they tried to talk sense to them. They said, look, they said, they said, neither fear ye the people of the land, for they are bred for us. Uh, Brother Roloff said, interpreted that as Caleb said, well, eat them like hot biscuits. <laughs> so they're bread for us. Uh, their defenses departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Fear them not. But all the congregation bade stone them with stones. So the ten spies and the children of Israel um, talked themselves out of uh, victory. They talked themselves into defeat. They talked themselves out of uh, conquering and didn't rise and go forth. And they ignored something else. They ignored the fact that the Lord had said to Moses the following, Send thou men that they may search the land of Canaan. This was before the spies went out. Send thou men that they may search the land of Canaan, which I give unto the children of Israel. God said, I, I, I give this land. And, and they let the promises of God be swallowed up by what they saw. And they walked by sight, not by faith. They saw it was before them and, and thought, surely God's promise can't overcome this. But it could. And it would have had they uh, 
stepped out by faith. God said, I give him the land. By the way, that's why the land's called the promised land. Because he promised to give it to him. And instead, they talked themselves out of getting it. They wandered uh, because of that in the wilderness 40 years until all the generation that had done evil on the side of the Lord was consumed. And wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith today, 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 if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts like maybe you have done so many times in the past. When God brought you just about to that place of conviction where you're going to make a change and then you just let it all go away and stayed the same. Harden not your hearts as in the provocation, in the day of temptation of the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works 40 years. Wherefore, I was grieved with that generation and said they do always err in their heart. They have not known my ways, so I swear my wrath. They shall not enter into my rest. These uh, words of the Lord spake uh, against a people that failed to arise, go forth, and conquer at his bidding. And it would have, been, would have been a great thing to attempt, just to make that attempt to conquer the promised land. They didn't do it. Of course, a later generation would, by the way, along with Joshua and Caleb, the two spies that said, we can do this. But the rest missed out. No doubt, no doubt there are some great things you should be attempting for God. Things that the Lord would help you conquer. Some victories over sin that you could win. Some higher ground to conquer. And in your mind, I, I think probably in moments of clarity and, and, and quietness, as you think about it, I think probably in your mind, uh, you have an idea of some of those areas that you'd like to conquer. And some of those changes that would be made in your life if you were the victorious Christian that you really inside want to be and know the Lord wants you to be. I mean, if you were to really take your Christian life to the next level, you got some sort of idea what it would look like, at least at least those next steps, don't you? And so if you do, I want to ask, what's keeping you from, from conquering those areas? And if you say it's too hard, again, I remind you with men, this is impossible. With God, all things are possible. So, so what good things would you like to see accomplished in your Christian life before it is too late? Think about them. Think about them. And I want you to rise by the grace of God, go forth and conquer, knowing that the Lord's on your side. You battle with whatever it is, whether it's sin, whether it's new ground to conquer, whether it's whatever. Get the Lord to help you. He can, He will. He's, he, he wants to. You'd be amazed, you'd be amazed, amazed, amazed at what the Lord could do through your life if you just would submit yourself to Him and let Him. And yield your body and put yourself in the place of, of victory, the place of service, the place of, of yielding where you need to be when you need to be there. It's a dark world out there, folks. It's a dark world. We need to arise and shine so they can have some light. We need to go forth as burning and shining lights, blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, holding forth the word of life. And if you fall well short of that, why don't you take a cue? Take your cue from the prodigal son. When he came to himself, said, I will arise and go to my father. And he did. Boy, and he got the blessing when he did. He had to humble himself first, and he humbled himself. And he came to him and he said, I'm no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of the hired servants. Boy, for a Christian to humble himself along those lines, I mean, God would know he'd be serious at that point, wouldn't he? And the Lord can put you on, back on track. Make you as the, um, put you on the, the path of the just, right? Which, which uh, shineth more and more into the perfect day where you can arise and shine. This old Christian hymn says, Rise up, O men of God, have done with lesser things. Give heart and soul and mind and strength to serve the King of Kings. And that's a good exhortation for men, women, and children, all, all of the above. So whatever you need to do, I want to invite you to, to do it. Do it right now. I want you to bow your heads. Close your eyes. And the invitation is for you. If you're pressed down, if you're asleep, if you're in defeat, if you're trying to rise up out of defeat and, and arise, go forth and conquer, whatever your case, if you, if you need to, to arise, I want your invitation is to, to literally arise out of your seat when the invitation starts and, and humble yourself and come down to an old-fashioned altar and do some business with God. Father, I, 
I pray that you would help us today and, and help anyone today, maybe discouraged, maybe depressed, maybe even despair. Help them, Lord, to take you at your word and hear the exhortation that you have for them personally today and to do something about it. Whatever needs to be done, help it to be done, I pray, during this invitation time and then afterwards. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd like you to rise, stand to your feet if you can. The music plays. We'll have heads bowed and eyes closed. Don't, don't go out unchanged if you need change. Don't go out without seeking the Lord's face if you need to seek His face. Arise today and go forth. Maybe to the altar. Conquer some things. Let the Lord help you. So come down, spend some time in the spiritual mountaintop with God, and then go forth shining like Moses did after he spent time with the Lord. Arise and shine. Lord, I'm thankful that in a dark world, Lord, you are the light of the world. And then you told us that, that we were. And we know the only way we can do that is to reflect your light. So help us to get the obstruction out of the way. And Lord, where business may yet need to be done based on uh, what you had for, uh, Lord, your people today. May that business be done. May it not be forgotten. May it not be sloughed off. May it not be uh, another message where they got right close to, to making a, a necessary change and and just let it wear away. And I pray you'd follow through and follow up and make some real changes, Lord, in each and every life that needs it and help us to live, Lord, as we ought, reflecting your light, uh, burning and shining in a dark world, uh, living on the victory side with the joy of the Lord as our strength. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.